Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the uh, Corbell Faculty Lecture Series on Religion and Violence, and also on behalf of the newly established Center for Middle East Studies, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Uh, the importance of the Arab Spring, both for the politics of the Middle East and the broader Arab Islamic world, and also for US foreign policy, really needs no treatment or justification. Um, one of the important developments, one of the most controversial developments in the Arab Spring, of course, is the rise to political power of political Islamist groups, uh, perhaps most importantly, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, clearly one of the most controversial and talked about aspects of the emerging politics of the region. And um, it's a huge honor for uh, us to have, uh, in my view, one of the leading experts of um, the Muslim Brotherhood of political thought of um, mainstream Sunni political Islam, um, um, one of the leading scholars of modern Egypt with us today, um, John Calvert, to help us <coughs> interpret uh, these developments. Uh, the format is that John Calvert will give a keynote a talk for about um, 40 minutes, and then there will be a discussant, and our discussant is our very own Micheline Bichet, um, um, who rumor has it that she had tickets to um, uh, attend um, President Obama's uh, talk today in Denver, and that she's chosen us over President Obama, and so we certainly appreciate that sacrifice. Um, it, John Calvert, for those people who do not know him, is the Henry W. Casper um, Associate Professor. Uh, he holds the Henry W. Casper Associate Professorship in History at Crichton University in Omaha, Nebraska. His research focuses on social protest and political res resistance movements in the modern Middle East as well as Egyptian nationalism and the ideological origins of Al-Qaeda. He's the author of Islamism, a documentary and reference guide published in 2007. And um, more recently, he's the author of uh, what is widely viewed to be one of the um, most important um, intellectual biographies of Sayyid Qutb, titled Sayyid Qutb and the Origins of Radical Islamism, published, published in 2010. He's also the co-translator and co-editor and translator, Sayyid Qutb's A Child from the Village. Uh, John Calvert's uh, intellectual biography of Qutb has been widely praised. Um, too many um, um, excerpts and back jacket, jack, back jacket endorsements to mention, but I'll just choose one out of, uh, out of a random list of, 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 of um, praise and, and uh, um, accolades for the book. The Economist has described the book uh, in the following terms. This rich and carefully researched biography sets Qutb for the first time in his Egyptian context, rescuing him from the caricature without whitewashing his radicalism. It is no small achievement. Um, the focus today, of course, is not on Sayyid Qutb, but it's really on the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the politics of, of Egypt post Mubarak, and it's a huge honor to have uh, John Calvert with us. Please join me in welcoming him to the today. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Hashemi, for that uh, very generous introduction. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I've had an opportunity to meet some new friends and uh, reconnect with at least one former student of mine, Becky Chabot, who's at the ILF School. And um, it's uh, nice reconnecting with her. Um, let me just begin with an anecdote. Um, in June 2011, I visited Cairo for three weeks. Um, Weeks earlier with my students at Creighton, I'd watched the drama of the Hosni uh, Mubarak fall from uh, power live in the Al Jazeera network with my students. Um, with people all over the world, we were aware that we were watching history in the making. So I was very eager to travel to Cairo. I knew Cairo quite well. It's a city I once lived in, and um, I visited Cairo many times. Yet in June 2011, it was clear that Cairo had changed, at least in terms of mood. The mega city was edgy. It was overtaken by an anxiety that I hadn't previously encountered. It seemed as though the Egyptian people had lost their famous sense of humor. In place of laughter, there was sullenness and despondency. The mood at Medan Tahrir was particularly tense. Because of the summer heat, the demonstrations were taking place in the relative cool of the evening. 
And so one night I wandered into the square expecting to talk with individuals and get a sense of what people were thinking. Uh, there were knots of young men arguing. Uh, there were groups um, of young men uh, in prayer. Others were shouting angry slogans. It was definitely not the ebullient atmosphere I had seen on TV. Suddenly I found myself surrounded by six or seven individuals who, judging from the look in their eyes, uh, meant to do me harm. They accused me of being an American spy. And in the best Arabic I could muster, I explained I was there, in fact, to support the revolution, that my intentions were entirely honorable. And just as things were getting nasty, uh, another person came up to me and said to me something in English that, that made an impression. He said that what was going on in the square that evening, indeed every evening, was an in-house discussion among citizens on the course of their revolution. These discussions and the arguments were private affairs. Egyptians were sorting out their business. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with them. For the moment, I wasn't welcome. Come back in a year or two and maybe we can talk. Well, I felt really terrible. I, I felt as though I had been spit out of Medan Tahrir, you know, gorged out onto the streets and so forth. But of course, I came to understand that this individual was quite right. He was correct. He knew the history. He knew the record of Western meddling and of attempts to mold Egypt and other countries of the Middle East in ways congruent with American and European security and economic interests. Even when these countries have extolled democracy, Washington and other Western capitals have proven less than willing to fully accept its consequences as the experiences of Algeria and Gaza bear out. And here we have the Egyptian people making their own history without undue interference from the outside. And as my Egyptian interlocuteur made clear, the results were bound to be messy, certainly in the short term, perhaps in the long term too. But at least the Egyptian people were forging their own destiny. Come back later and we'll show you the results, whatever they might be. Of course, one of the notable consequences of this history in the making has been the political prominence of the Islamists, most notably in Nahda in Tunisia and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the focus of my talk today. Most observers, including me, are surprised at just how well the Islamists in Egypt and Tunisia have done in the various elections that have been held over the past year or so. We shouldn't be. For one thing, over the past quarter of a century or so, many societies in the Middle East, including in Egypt, have become more socially and culturally conservative than was the case previously. In part, this was due to the inflow of money and influence from the Gulf, especially from Saudi Arabia, but it was also due to former President Mubarak's partial accommodation of the Islamist trend. And both of these trends gave rise in various ways to an assertive missionary trend represented by preachers like Sheikh Sharawi, and more recently by the uh, televangelist, if I can use that term, uh, Amr Khalid. As a result, the Muslim Brotherhood, with its great mobilizing skill, is able to plant its flag uh, in relatively fertile soil. But the question everyone is asking, of course, is what the Islamist ascendancy means for Egypt and for the region as a whole. Some observers, both within and without Egypt, see a looming disaster. They view the Muslim Brotherhood as having a hidden political agenda, one that will ultimately stymie the promise of universal human rights, stunt the development of democracy, and encourage or perhaps even legislate religious obscurantism, especially in the areas of gender relations and minority religious rights. Further, they see the Muslim Brotherhood as an incubator or a facilitator of politically motivated violence. It's no accident, they say, that many of the jihadis operative in the world in recent years were affiliated in one way or another with the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, they say, the, uh, the Mubarak regime did the world a favor by uh, curtailing uh, Brotherhood activities. But others, of course, are more optimistic regarding the Brotherhood's current and future political behavior. 
These observers say that if elements within the Brotherhood practiced violence in the past, that violence was a consequence of blockages which the state placed in the movement's way, or else was the result of, of the savage persecution and torture of its cadres. In other words, authoritarianism has been the cause rather than the panacea of Islamist militancy. They say that now the road is open, we can expect the Muslim Brotherhood to operate as any normal political organization would. In this case, as a legitimate political player in the country's life, one that happens to have a conservative agenda, um, but not an extreme one necessarily. In fact, these commentators go on to say, the tight control the Brotherhood has over its members, and we have to remember that the Brotherhood is a very hierarchically organized movement, ensures that troublemakers within the organization will be reined in, will be disciplined in one way or another. My own view is closer to the, the second proposition, um, although not without uh, serious reservations. It seems to me that what we're dealing with in the Muslim Brotherhood is not an ideology on the loose. It's not the manifestation of an immutable animating idea that propels actors in this direction or that. What we're dealing with is a classic social movement, uh, one that springs from strains in the social, economic, and political environment, organizes supporters, frames its activities in culturally appropriate ways, in this case in terms of symbols, doctrines, and vocabularies drawn from Islam's great heritage, and is flexible in adapting to changing circumstances. So I think we have to regard the Muslim Brotherhood as an evolving organization, one that rolls with history, and whose members rationally adjust their doctrine in relation to circumstances. Indeed, the evidence for this really stares us in the face. Over the past half century, we've seen the Brotherhood change from a secretive, rather hard-nosed organization into one that's today hardly different from other secular Egyptian uh, political parties. Yet despite this flexibility, the policies of the Muslim Brotherhood are, and, and I would say always have been, bounded and limited by ideology. And at the core of this ideology is the premise that sovereignty resides with God, not with the people. Left to their own devices, people will get into all kinds of mischief and trouble. They don't know what's best for them, but God does. And in his mercy, he has provided humankind with laws, regulations, and advice for purposeful, righteous living. Now, it's true um, that in the early Middle Ages, Muslim jurists distinguished between duties owed to God uh, such as prayer, fasting, and pilgrimage, which are immutable, unchanging, and rulings related to economic and social life, which can be adapted to the changing requirements of time and locality. But even as regards the second interpretive sphere, jurists have been careful to point out that any judgment must conform to Quranic principles. So the question facing the Muslim brothers today is this. Will they be able to engage in the political process with all that that entails in terms of negotiation and coalition building without compromising these, various, these, these very principles? Taking heed of these principles, will they be able to fashion a polity whose laws are congruent with universal human rights standards, especially in the realms of gender relations and religious minority rights? The appeal of the Muslim Brotherhood has always been moral and cultural. But is it now capable of directing and transforming a modern state? And as I have to say, on these issues, the Muslim Brotherhood has not been terribly forthcoming. It's leaving us in suspense as regards answers to many of these questions. And perhaps it's the case that its members, who themselves are deeply divided on many of these issues, haven't yet come to any kind of consensus. But one thing is clear. Should the brothers prevail, we may be facing the possibility of a procedural democracy 
with limited rights for certain groups and individuals, an illiberal democracy, if you will. Now, in order to make the point of the unprecedented situation in which the Muslim Brotherhood finds itself, it might be useful to briefly trace the various stages of the, of the movement's development. And I'll identify four of these. Um, each one is related to a particular set of opportunities and constraints. Now, initially, as many of you know, the Muslim Brotherhood was concerned with combating creeping westernization. Um, Westernization that its founder, Hassan al-Banna, blamed for Egypt, Egypt's and the Islamic world's um, civilizational malaise, which made it vulnerable to Western European conquest and occupation. And in his efforts to morally regenerate the Muslim world, al-Banna was influenced uh, first by the residual traces of late Ottoman pan-Islamism, uh, by the Salafi trend that in those days was emanating out of Syria especially, but also by discourses of um, self-development um, that had their origins in the West. Uh, we have to remember that the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood is be prepared, um, a phrase that should bring to mind Lord Baden-Powell and the Boy Scouts. Now, Albana's methods were simple and direct missionary movement and uh, missionary uh, activity and uh, political advocacy. Over the course of the 1930s and 1940s, he penned his famous letters to King Farouk, enjoining the monarch to fear God and implement more Sharia in society. But he was also a shrewd political operator. So while he condemned political parties as divisive forces in society, at one point, he proposed that the Muslim Brotherhood contest elections, uh, not because he expected to win these, but because he believed that electoral participation would help spread the movement's message. And, of course, Albana's pragmatic, gradualist approach has been a hallmark of the society up to the present day. Now, it's true that in the 1940s, elements within the Muslim Brotherhood turned to violence and assassination, and here I'm referring to the infamous secret uh, apparatus. But we have to understand that this violence was circumstantial and it was related to the contentious political culture of the time. I mean, every party, um, every faction in Egypt in those days had its militia and the Muslim Brotherhood was really no exception. Now, the next phase of Brotherhood history emerged within the context of the movements triced with the Gamal Abdel Nasser regime in the 1950s and 1960s. And as is well known, the prescriptions, the imprisonments, and torture endured by hundreds of Muslim brothers, including most notably Sayyid Qutb, gave birth to a far harsher version of the Muslim Brothers' ideology. Um, one that didn't seek social and political engagement, but that instead sought withdrawal from society, a society that had lost its way. By the mid-1960s, the Qutbists um, had formed their own movement within the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which became known as Organization 65. Uh, Sayyid Qutb uh, famously pegged the Egyptian and other Muslim societies of the time as Jahili, ignorant of God's will. And he also called upon a vanguard of true believers to actively confront the powers that be, um, a tact that in the end led to an even harsher response on the part of the political authorities. The third phase of brotherhood development emerged in the late 1960s when Supreme Leader Hassan al-Hudaybi wrote his famous tractate, Preachers Not Judges in which he pledged that the Muslim Brotherhood, should it be allowed to reconstitute, uh, would forever eschew violence. The Muslim Brothers, he said, were preachers. They were dedicated to the reform of society. They weren't hanging judges of other Muslims, as radical interpretations of Qutb's doctrine suggested they were. And here I have to make the point that the Muslim Brotherhood has always interpreted jihad in a range of meanings. Um, the concept of militant jihad has always been part of its religious teachings. Um, jihad is justified, according to Albana, but also Hudaybi, when Muslim lands are occupied. 
Yet Hudaybi's document really did set the parameters for the Muslim Brothers' accommodation with the authoritarian regimes of Sadat and Mubarak. And one of the signal features of this period of rebuilding was the experience um, of, of, of a new cadre of Muslim brothers um, who were recruited from the university campuses, including people like um, Abul Fatua, uh, Issam al Aryan, uh, young men who sought to move the Muslim Brotherhood in a much more reformist and political direction. And this group of younger brothers um, led the movement uh, to dominate the political syndicates. Um, they involved the movement in parliamentary elections by aligning with legal political parties like the New Waft and Labour, um, but also by running candidates as independents. But two factors intervened to curtail the Brothers' steady march. Um, one was the attitude of the state. Beginning in the early 1990s, the regime responded to the electoral successes of the Brothers by reining the movement in, by imprisoning its leaders, by closing down its publications. Mubarak began during this period to claim that the Muslim Brotherhood was the mother, the source of all militant Islamism in the world. But the other debilitating factor related to squabbles within the movement between the old guard, men who had experienced Nasser's prisons and who tended to be secretive and conservative, and these younger reformers I was talking about. Um, the conservative group managed in almost every turn to frustrate the reformers in their efforts to put the movement on a new, more progressive footing. Indeed, by 2000, they had pulled the movement in an isolationist direction, withdrawing from politics and shoring up basic, original ideological positions. So when the Brotherhood issued its party draft platform in 2007, it included clauses calling for an Iranian-style group of clerics to vet legislation and for the banning of uh, cops and women from the presidency, uh, conservative positions that flew in the face of uh, what the liberal reformers had been um, uh, trying to achieve. So um, when the demonstrations of January 25th broke out, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was already, already operating in a very careful inward looking mode. And so with tens of thousands of uh, people protesting in the streets, uh, the movement dithered about what course to take. And here, of course, it had the hard lesson of Algeria in mind. I mean, would Egypt's general, generals allow um, an assertive Islamic movement to present itself as a uh, serious political contender? But after a few days, um, one of the Brotherhood's youth leaders managed to pull um, the entire organization, you know, in, into the demonstrations. These youth were much more comfortable than the old guard, um, even more comfortable than the generation of the 1970s in jumping into what was a very uh, uncertain and volatile situation. Um, but still those in control moved slowly. Um, they took stock of the political field, and it was during this period that, that many people supposed that the uh, Muslim Brotherhood was cooperating with Egypt's military, that there was some type of secret understanding. I'm not sure that that was the case. But it's this breakdown of Egypt's authoritarian order and the opening of new possibilities that marked the fourth and current stage of the mother, Muslim Brothers history. And this stage is without question the most consequential. Because now, out of necessity, the Muslim Brotherhood is operating under a fully political logic. Never before has the movement been given the kind of space and latitude it now enjoys. Never before has the movement been given the kind of space it now enjoys. The reformers, who in the 1990s had been sidelined, now have their opportunity. And even the old guard, at least most of them, recognize the consequences, um, the possibilities of, of the current situation. But herein lies the challenge. I mean, it's one thing to deliberate from a position of opposition, as the Muslim Brotherhood traditionally have done. In such a condition, you can remain vague, you can be noncommittal, you can be very idealistic. 
But once in power, you have to engage with the real world. You have to be pragmatic. The Muslim Brotherhood now has no choice but to accommodate to the fast-changing situation, while at the same time remaining true to its founding principle. And this is no easy task. Now, certainly other movements and parties have met the challenge of change while working within an ideological framework. Think, for example, of the twists and turns taken by socialism, European socialism in the 19th century onward. But the Muslim Brotherhood is not an ordinary political organization. It's a movement of ethical and moral reform with myriad social and devotional activities. In fact, there's been a long-standing belief in the Brotherhood that involvement in politics would sully the mission of the movement. That to drag the movement as a whole into the maelstrom of politics would force it to abandon its idealism in pursuit of short-term political gains. Now, the way out of this dilemma was for the Muslim Brotherhood to form a distinct political organization, the Freedom and Justice Party, which would express Brotherhood ideals, but would exist separately from the movement. As a distinct entity, the party could engage freely with political contenders without compromising the traditional purpose of the parent organization. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood has required that party leaders leave their official positions in the movement prior to taking office. There's to be no double dipping. And once it entered the political fray, the Freedom and Justice Party did very well. It won a majority of seats in the parliament and it gained the presidency, thanks largely to the Muslim Brotherhood's deep social roots and nationwide presence, which it had established in the 1980s and 1990s. So what the Freedom and Justice Party and, by extension, the Muslim Brotherhood want is um, for a, they want a democratic constitution, one that would allow the popular will to be expressed through Egypt's existing institutions. In this sense, the party's constitutional aspirations aren't too different from those of most of the other political forces in the country, whether leftist or liberal. Where the Freedom and Justice Party differs from its competitors is in its insistence that the Egyptian civil state operate within what it calls an Islamic frame of reference. This is a concept that first appeared in the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, 2007 uh, party draft platform. But what does this mean, an Islamic frame of reference? Well, at first blush, the notion seems to be compatible with Egypt's long-standing constitutional stipulation in force since the 1970s that all civil law in the country should be compatible with the principles of the Sharia. This stipulation was made deliberately vague and it allowed the legislators of the Mubarak era um, a lot of wiggle room uh, to craft laws that ensured the basically secular nature of the state. But now, with its party members dominating the ranks of the Constitutional Drafting Committee, the Muslim Brotherhood sees an opportunity to give teeth to this stipulation. After all, you know, we have to remember that the Muslim Brotherhood's distinctiveness has always been in the religious and cultural spheres. But how far will it go in deferring to Sharia rulings is still unknown. And we don't yet know the mechanism by which laws proposed by the legislature will be approved as to their compatibility with the Sharia. For the time being, it looks as though mercy is not in favor of a vetting council made up of Azharis or otherwise. Certainly there's some reason to hope that the party will take a moderate tact. After all, the Muslim Brotherhood is seeking domestic and international legitimacy for its governance. And so it doesn't want to appear extreme. But on the other hand, there are conservatives in the movement. And even the moderates within the party feel an obligation to present a distinctive Islamic orientation before the public and political competitors. That is, to bend the rules in an Islamic direction. And chief among these competitors are the puritanical Salafis, who have surprisingly given up their you know, historical hesitation to involve themselves in politics by forming the Noor Party, which contested the parliamentary elections and actually succeeded 
in gaining seats. In fact, I think it's uh, because President Morsi felt a need to indulge these more conservative elements that he initially allowed protests to take place at the U.S. Embassy, um, you know, against that sort of notorious anti-Islamic film. Um, these protests, of course, were spearheaded and organized by Salafi elements. But it was only when things began to get out of hand with the arrival of the football ultras, who had their own bone to pick with uh, the Egyptian police as a result of the fiasco that took place in, um, at the Ismaili Stadium, that he reined in uh, the protesters uh, with not a, lo a little pressure from, from Washington. So given the Muslim Brotherhood's traditional view uh, that the state has a protective role as regards society, and given the influence of religious conservative elements both within and without the movement, there's a real and legitimate concern that the rights of women, religious minorities, and the promise of full political pluralism might fall short of universal human rights standards. But at this point, we simply don't know what's going to happen. Those in Egypt who, appoint, who oppose rather the Brotherhood, both in the street and in the political arena, are still very much present in the ongoing debate over the course of Egypt's future. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had one of the worst incidents of street violence to, to date, um, not surprisingly, between the supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and elements from the various strands of the secular opposition. Now, when it comes to the Freedom and Justice Party's foreign policy interests and, and initiatives, we see the same basic effort to steer a moderate course between idealism and uh, pragmatism. A case in point is the Muslim Brothers' position on the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood strongly supports the Palestinian cause. However, it also understands that it has to act pragmatically. So, although it will continue to criticize Israeli policy, it understands that Egypt's population and its military, not to mention the United States, whose cooperation and goodwill are necessary for getting Egypt's economy on track, would balk at the possibility of renewed conflict. So, although individual brothers condemn the treaty, some have even suggested holding a, a public referendum on it, the party and the movement as a whole will uphold it, even as they will uphold, with some modifications, current restrictions on traffic through the Rafah crossing into Gaza. As regards Gaza, the Freedom and Justice Party obviously feels close affinity with Hamas. Um, it is, after all, the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. But it still will not allow Hamas to open offices in Cairo, uh, that is, unless it gets on board regarding Sinai security and acknowledges the validity of existing agreements reached between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. So again, the Freedom and Justice Party wants to be seen as a responsible player in international politics. But of course, the bottom line for any kind of domestic legitimacy is the Muslim Brotherhood's performance on the economic front. And as you're all aware, Egypt's economy is in shambles. Uh, people are out of work and really quite desperate. Um, Cairo looks shabbier than ever. Um, there's a general bleakness to the place. Um, a great depression has sort of fallen over uh, Egypt. And the crime rate remains high. Um, I was talking to a doctor who said that, um, and this was um, a couple of summers ago, who said that the emergency um, Wards were, were admitting between well, 50 knife and gunshot uh, patients a night. Uh, many of those Egyptians who voted for former strongman uh, Ahmed Shafiq um, in the presidential elections did so because they did not trust the Brotherhood to put Egypt's house in order, even though they were sympathetic uh, to the Brotherhood's moral agenda. So the elephant in the room is the Freedom and Justice Party's ability to improve the material lives of the um, suffering Egyptian people. So just to conclude, we might raise eyebrows or even despair at the prospect of an Islamist party coming to power in Egypt. Um, we might be optimistic about it. Um, will the Muslim Brotherhood play the role of midwife to democracy? Regardless, we have to remember that Egypt now has an elected government 
with a significant degree of legitimacy. And to a rather large extent, the Muslim Brotherhood represents mainstream Egyptian opinion as regards the desirability of conservative values and a more honorable role for Egypt's place in world affairs. So the rest of the world, including the United States, I think will simply have to accommodate uh, to this emerging reality. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for this insightful talk. I'm um, sorry you were not welcome in Cairo. So on behalf of the University of Denver, assalamu alaikum, <laughs> Dr. Kamer, shukran. I hope uh, you find this uh, environment hospitable. Uh, very insightful talk, very controversial issues with respect to the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm a scholar of uh, revolution and human rights struggle. And the first thing that comes to mind when I think about post-revolutionary phases and which group can actually sustain uh, its power in that particular phase, there are three conditions that come to my mind. So the first one is the one that you brought into the, your conversation, in your discussion, in your talk. And I'm here just reacting impromptu because I did not have a, a talk. I just want to say that to the audience. So the first point uh, is about the capacity of that movement, now the Muslim Brotherhood, to forge coalitions with, uh, on the one side, the Salafis and the most uh, secular groups. So developing a consensus, uh, whether hegemonic or not, is one of the critical and salient points for stability uh, post-revolutionary phase. And this is the one point that you brought uh, to our attention. Of course, this yielded to one concern, uh, which you uh, alluded to, and that is would the Muslim Brotherhood succeed not only to consolidate itself and uh, steward Egypt toward uh, democratization, but would it succeed indeed to also protect the rights of women? We know, and you've mentioned this, that article, uh, was it article 63? 30, 36 no, 68, that is debated currently right now in the Egyptian parliament protects the rights of women, but always under the specter of Sharia law. This is not a simple specter, I mean, a simple problem, because as we know, throughout the region, uh, the, the Islamists have taken uh, inroads and have changed constitutions, who actually re reasserted the fact that uh, Sharia law would be always the, the legitimizing sources to uh, uh, adjudicate legislation. So we have that in Kuwait, we've seen that also in Iraq, we have seen that uh, even there was discussion like that in Libya and Sudan. So the joker is always in the deck when we talk about Islamic framework of reference, and that's an important issue. We cannot simply marginalize it. The second condition I think is very important, and you just talked about at the very end of your talk, is that will the Muslim Brotherhood succeed in delivering the social and economic good that will enable it to sustain its power over a long period of time? And as we know right now, um, uh, there is not one economic vision within the Muslim Brotherhood. There have been discussions as uh, early as May uh, whether the uh, Muslim Brotherhood would accept an international uh, from the International Monetary Fund a $4.8 million loan. This was rejected by the Salafis, no, no movement, because it was seen as a contradiction with um, Islamic laws with a sort of was seen as sort of a form of usury uh, due to the interest and the string attached that would come along with the International Monetary Fund. So the question is always an interesting question. Where would the money come from uh, for those parties to sustain themselves? If it's not the West, then where else? Of course, what we see these days uh, is on the one hand, we have um, the Sa Saudi Arabia have, uh, uh, and, and Qatar as a channel a certain amount of funding, substantial amount of funding uh, throughout the regions and, and enable many groups, Islamic, Muslim Brotherhood, to sustain themselves as a result of that. We know that in Syria, we know that that has occurred in, in Libya, we know that it's occurring in Egypt and even uh, with the Ennahda party in Tunisia. So uh, this, we cannot just simply say that there is no 
uh, influence in the region. There is influence in the region, and the influence is actually radical in a way. And so, uh, one to watch when we talk about the consolidation to a democrat democracy. And then the third point that uh, you brought also to my attention, but it's also the question that one is always asking with respect to post-revolutionary group, um, would the, any post-revolutionary group, so uh, to make sort of a, for a moment an abstraction to the Muslim Brotherhood, succeed in promoting reforms while keeping order? That's always the bigger, big question. And we know that by just before the election, it was sort of a mini Etienne Brumaire, mini military coup d'etat, when the mi military arrived and really dismantled the parliament, and finally, uh, it was enabled to be reconstituted itself. So the military are watching. There is a modus vivendi, as you, you mentioned in your talk, between the Muslim Brotherhood on one hand and the military. But if we see a slippery slope going to favoring the Salafis, uh, where will the, will the military take over? Will the, the Muslim Brotherhood succeed in maintaining its power? And if so, how so? So I think uh, what I'm trying to suggest here in my comments and also my concern, which some of them I know you're sharing, but perhaps I'm highlighting it then because you are more on the positive side of the, the story. So I have as a commentator trying to highlight the negative side of the story. But what I'm trying to suggest here is that uh, you seem at the beginning of the talk to suggest that there shouldn't be um, any, any external uh, influence. It is an Egyptian revolution after all. But my concern is that there are, there are influences and they are coming from the Gulf countries. And, and, and if that is the case, shouldn't we think and consider how external force, Europe, the United States, countervail the influence of the Gulf country? Because we don't know where they are going. They, they might just go to the Salafist movement or the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so it's sort of a question that I want just to pose to you. And then and, uh, if you can briefly respond to that, and then perhaps we can move to the floor and have uh, broader discussions afterwards. Yes, so thank you very much. Yes. Since you are our esteemed guest, would you like to sort of respond to some of Micheline's comments and then we'll open up for q Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for those uh, comments. Um, they're really very insightful, and um, I agree with most of what you said. Um, I agree also that um, the rest of the world has to sort of engage itself with the transformations that are taking place in Egypt today. Um, in the past, we, by we I mean the United States and other, other Western countries, supported the Mubarak regime uh, financially, militarily, and in other ways. Um, that regime is now gone. Uh, we have a uh, relatively a, a, a populist movement in power. And I think um, the um, Obama administration um, has been engaging with the Muslim Brotherhood, um, recognizing that it really is the new sort of power on the block, um, and has been sort of um, trying to sort of um, uh, apply soft power um, in this new situation. Um, and I, I really think that is the uh, way that um, any sort of Western government must, must go. Um, that we cannot sort of dictate to this new government. Uh, we can influence it through, the, uh, through soft power. Um, but I really do believe that there's, um, there's sort of an indigenous movement that's sort of charting its own, its own course that we have to respect. Um, President Morsi has made it very clear that he wants the rest of the world to recognize the dignity of Egypt. Um, he has made this clear to the Obama administration that um, the country will no longer sort of be dictated to, that Egypt will pursue its own interests and so forth. Um, to what extent Egypt will be able to sort of accomplish that, of course, is a, a moot point. Um, but it does look like the Egyptian president has been taking um, uh, Egypt in a, in, a, in, a, in a more sort of independent uh, course. And this is um, evident, for example, in President Morsi's um, recent trip to Iran. Um, I think the Islamic Republic uh, was expecting something close to a love fest, you know, when, when Morsi um, came to the unaligned meeting at Tehran. Instead, um, Morsi sort of upbraided the establishment, political establishment in Iran by um, 
criticizing the Assad regime, uh, which uh, of course the Iranian regime um, supports in, in, in various ways. Um, again, charting sort of an independent course of action. Um, your other point is um, a very, very good one. Uh, and, and I think this is the, the major challenge facing Egypt today is the uh, economy. And um, getting the economy back on track will require um, investment from abroad. Um, your question was where is the money going to come from? Um, certainly from the Gulf countries. Um, countries like Qatar and so forth have, have stepped forward with promises. Um, but the United States also um, is, uh, uh, is, of course, uh, a, a possible funder of, 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 uh, of Egyptian development. I mean, it has been, you know, for, for, for years and years. And I, I would expect this American funding uh, to continue. Um, now, there are, you know, some people in, in Washington who believe that U.S. funding should have strings attached to it. Um, uh, I'm not so sure that will, um, uh, would be a good idea. But um, perhaps at this point, we could sort of open it up to the floor. Before we do that, I'm going to sort of try and push you a little bit on a point that Michelle yes. raised. And she talked about external influence coming into Egypt. And of course, there's a lot of very negative and nefarious influence coming from the Gulf, supporting Salafist groups. And she sort of hinted that perhaps there can be a countervailing influence coming from the United States and Europe that could perhaps balance that uh, negative force and support for ultra-conservative sort of elements. Do you believe that that's a possibility? And if so, how might that influence from, uh, from the West or Europe more positively manifest, manifest itself in terms of sort of Egypt's democratic uh, direction? Right. Well, I'm not exactly sure how, how the West would be able to sort of, you know, counter that sort of indigenous trend. I mean, Salafism has been present in Egypt for decades and decades. I mean, you, we can trace its development back to the early decades of the um, 20th century. And especially in the last uh, 10 or 20 years or so, it's been a, 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 a very powerful social force. Um, I, I think all the West could do would be to apply, again, sort of soft power um, by perhaps funding or supporting uh, more sort of uh, moderate or um, liberal sort of groups within Egyptian society. Um, but I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't see the possibility of any kind of, you know, sort of direct intervention to counter that trend. I, I just don't think it would be possible. Okay, let's open for you. Uh, yeah, first question. Right um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Great, great. Um, so I, I read earlier in an article today uh, about that there's um, uh, developing an increasing relationship between Egypt and Turkey, um, the economic and then political ties. And I was wondering, um, of course, that since Turkey is uh, one of the more democratic uh, Islamic countries uh, around today. Is it possible for Turkey to serve as a, as a good influence on Egypt? And what, to what extent do you think they will serve as a good influence on Egypt in that regard? And also, is, could Turkey possibly be a channel for the West to, uh, to, to indirectly apply influence? Because Turkey is closer to the West than a lot of other Islamic countries. Yes, well, that's a very good question. Um, you know, people, of course, have been talking about the Turkish model um, for some time now, that it might serve as an inspiration for Islamism in the Arab Middle East. Um, I think that is a possibility. Of course, you know, Islamism in Turkey has its own distinct history. It uh, has its own, you know, sort of challenges and so forth. Um, I don't think there's a possibility of the Turkish model being applied directly to Egypt or other Arabic-speaking countries in the Middle East. Um, but, but certainly, I, I think there's a possibility for a conversation to take place, you know, between Turkish Islamists and Egyptian or Tunisian Islamists. And I think this is occurring. And I think there's going to be a cross-fertilization of ideas. I mean, this is a very sort of exciting time in modern Middle East history. Um, there are all kinds of currents at play. And uh, Turkey is kind of a salient sort of uh, example of how a modern state can adopt an Islamist ethos and um, yet sort of, you know, engage with the world, um, develop a modern economy, and um, respect to a large degree uh, universal human rights standards. Hi, there. <clears throat> My question is actually on, on the economy. Um, uh, you mentioned before 
you know, the, uh, recent developments. Uh, uh, there have been uh, questions about uh, how equitable Egyptian development uh, was uh, in the post Nasser period, especially. Um, in 2009, I uh, was the chief advisor to the UNDP project on Arab trade and human development. And I did some modeling, and uh, uh, it basically uh, showed what I already had su suspected that a new liberal term. Uh, Egyptian economy and the further new liberal proposals to basically liberalize trade further um, uh, would really benefit uh, the general population of Egypt very little uh, and probably would lead to very dubious uh, and uh, very incremental contribution, if any, to economic growth. Uh, and now the situation is a little worse uh, uh, because of the dislocation. So what uh, uh, does the Islamic Brotherhood, uh, their political uh, component, uh, and other parties uh, uh, think about uh, uh, the possible development strategy? What uh, kind of expenditures would need to be uh, increased, and how, and how soon, and especially with respect to protecting the lives of women and children? Uh, on which Egypt actually did make uh, uh, some progress, uh, 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 although they were stalled uh, under Mubarak uh, uh, during the uh, 90s uh, uh, on and from then on. So uh, 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 the sort of question of where the money is going to come from, the outstates actually will give money, but how are they going to be spent and what are the political priorities in terms of the political economy? Yeah, so it's a very good question, and as Micheline indicated, there are certainly differences of opinion within the Muslim Brotherhood on this question of economic development. Um, certainly the Muslim Brotherhood, as they stand today, are not socialists. Um, most of the leading Muslim brothers are strong capitalists. Many of them are very, very wealthy, in fact. Um, they have indulged in private the, 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 the neoliberal economy that had been established in Egypt over the past quarter century or so, and they have done very well by it. Um, on the other hand, as Muslim brothers, they do feel an obligation, a very strong obligation, to take care of the less fortunate um, in society, those who have been suffering um, as a consequence of this neoliberal economy and who have suffered as a consequence of the disruptions that have taken place in the course of uh, Egypt's recent revolution. Um, so I think the Muslim Brothers will encourage um, outside investment. Um, they are adamant that any loans you know, contracted from the World Bank or International Monetary Fund uh, should not have strings attached, um, should not be designed, in other words, to cut basic subsidies that would hurt the people. Um, so um, I, I guess, you know, they're interested in maintaining sort of, uh, you know, a, a capitalist economy in Egypt, um, but at the same time ensuring that Egypt does not become sort of a, a slave to the, uh, the World Bank and other international uh, economic institutions. Uh, I don't know if you, as an economist, have um, anything to add to that. Well, I would, uh, uh, at that point, Uh, ministries that uh, are involved in social expenditures, uh, uh, they should be strengthened, and uh, the gap between the urban rich and urban poor really uh, is so huge in Egypt, uh, and it is one of the main factors actually in, in the uprisings uh, uh, that uh, people should recognize more clearly. Uh, that needs to be narrowed, that should be uh, made actually the top priority in terms of uh, uh, economic policy within Egypt, uh, and that should be part of their, of their planning. Uh, and Egypt actually has the human resources to do uh, the kind of uh, detailed planning that uh, uh, needs to be done. Uh, so that is uh, uh, not a problem for Egypt. The problem is political will and implementation. Uh, as I said, drawing the resources from uh, in surplus uh, uh, economies in the Gulf uh, uh, would not be a problem uh, uh, for Egypt especially. Uh, and there are lots of expatriate Egyptians uh, who are very wealthy too. Uh, so I don't see that as a main problem. I see the main problem as one of defining the political priorities correctly. And uh, uh, 
there are plenty of good advice from within Egypt and, and outside of, of the Egypt. So this is an area that I hope you know, they will focus on. And I think you'll write, and I'll just briefly add to that, that of course corruption was a big sort of issue amongst all groups that have engaged in the revolutionary process in the last couple of years. And corruption, of course, was sort of equated with this great gap between sort of rich and poor in Egypt. And of course, one of the uh, Brotherhood's you know, sort of uh, primary goals was to you know, scrub the state clean of this type of political corruption. In, in, in that sense, I think they can be compared with Nasser and the free officers who came to power in 1952 with a similar agenda, although not within an Islamic framework. Okay. Arvid. I'm going to try to broaden this a little bit and bring in some uh, deep concerns I have because I'm, uh, I carry a very, very pessimistic streak in me about what is going to happen there. Um, James Carroll <clears throat> recently wrote in a book, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that the Jewish population in the Middle East and the Arab countries <clears throat> after World War II was 850,000, and the number has now shrunk to 4,500, uh, 4, I think is the number. Uh, he gives because of the dramatic changes which took place in the process of nation building uh, in the Middle East. I'm trying to carry it um, back to a World War II as I'm a historian. Um, and it's very, very close to a model which is one of the best books written on the subject of state building in our time, um, a book called Faith and Nation by Anthony Marx, um, argues that state building very often is done at the expense of religious minorities. First the Jews, of course, the Christian population have been shrinking as well in the Middle East, and now we have Egypt with um, a very large Coptic Christian uh, population, and even though the numbers are larger than the Jews in the Middle East, this is very worrisome in terms of the future. And uh, if M Marx had argued that France and Britain and Spain um, built their states by expelling minorities, in other words, and it was based on religion, in other words, the idea of faith, uh, suggesting that even in Egypt you may have a swing of the Muslim Brotherhood back to its religious principles in spite of its, pra uh, <coughs> its current taste for pragmatism. Uh, this is really worrisome because, first of all, it means that the uh, Coptics would suffer a fate not unlike the Jews in the Middle East, and that uh, this would not only threaten democracy um, because there's no guarantee that democracy is going to continue in the Middle East. Many, many countries have gone through processes which have quite horrific endings to that, but also lead to massive amounts of intolerance. And um, anything that remains of tolerance would be swept away as um, following the model of, of Francois Ferre, governments in power, terrified of losing power, particularly in revolutionary situations uh, like this, would uh, turn to uh, models of defending themselves. And that would mean expulsion and ethnic cleansing and uh, God knows what else, because there's a pattern for this already set in the story of Jews in the Middle East since 1945. So I'm sorry to bring such a dark view of this, but um, um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the possibilities that the revolution in Egypt will uh, go the way of um, other revolutions which turn um, to very conservative principles, in this case religious principles, which would be a disaster in terms of democracy in this very large and important and populated country. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point, and uh, certainly minorities have been victims of ethno-nationalism throughout the history of the 20th century. Um, you might even, we might even talk about, you know, the exchange of populations between Greece and Turkey in the 1920s and so forth. It's been a signal feature of our dark century. Um, the, the cops in Egypt, I think, have reason to be concerned. Um, they've been targeted by Salafi Muslims, as you know. There have been church burnings, um, attacks on Coptic populations in the provinces, um, even in Cairo, in neighborhoods such as Mbaba and so forth. Um, I think the Muslim Brotherhood, um, as the party that's in power, um, sees a real sort of need to sort of rein in the vociferous elements and protect the cops. I think the Muslim Brotherhood has gone out of its way, at least rhetorically, to make the point that the cops are full citizens of the Egyptian nation and their rights will be protected. Um, now, there are sort of certain question marks as to whether a Coptic Christian would ever be allowed to hold the presidency. I mean, that was not allowed during the period of bureaucratic authoritarianism. It probably won't be allowed under a Muslim Brotherhood government. We have yet to see how that, you know, what happens. Um, but I think the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, is seeking both domestic and international legitimacy. 
Um, I think it sees uh, an, uh, it is an obligation to protect the, the, the Coptic population. Uh, you could argue that it hasn't really done a very good job in that respect. Um, but I don't think it would endorse or facilitate, you know, um, uh, a, a massive sort of persecution of Egypt's uh, Coptic population. Um, I, I think it will, will try very hard again to sort of rein in those Salafi forces that are behind most of these attacks. But the Copts do have reason to be concerned. And before we go to another question, I'm going to take advantage of my privileged position here as MC to push you on another question that sort of is related to uh, part of your presentation, and that has to do with the rise of this Salafist movement. About a year ago, there were presidential elections in Egypt, and out of nowhere, this uh, movement, the Noor Party and the Salafist movement, captures about 25% of the vote. How do you, I mean, did that, would that, did that surprise you in terms of the, the strength and organizational sophistication of this? Out of this of this movement that came seemingly out of nowhere to capture about a quarter of the Egyptian vote, and then the follow-up question is: What is the rise of the Salafist movement in Egypt? What effect is it having on the Muslim Brotherhood? Is it pushing it to the left, to the more democratic sort of left, or to a more ultra-conservative position? What effect, in other words, is the is the Salafist movement having on domestic Egyptian politics with respect to Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, I, I think the success of the Salafis in, in the electoral politics caught everyone, including myself, by surprise. Um, Salafis, of course, traditionally have sort of eschewed politics. They have focused on pious activities, missionary activities, devotional activities. Um, but suddenly, with this political opening, they decided to organize politically, and they captured a significant number of seats in Egypt's parliament. Um, and, you know, they, 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 like, they took advantage of the moment. They said that, listen, uh, this is an opportunity for us to influence society. Um, we should organize politically and contest the elections and that way propagate our message to the wider population. Um, and your second point the was... The effects it has on... It, it, it right. Well, I think, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is a, is, 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 a, is a very diverse organization. You have, you know, liberal elements within the Brotherhood. Um, you have very conservative elements within the Brotherhood. And those conservative elements overlap with the Salafis. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have the same sort of diversity within the Azhar itself. You know, you have liberal scholars and conservative Salafi scholars. You have Muslim brothers, you know, within the Azhar and so forth. So the political field is very, very diverse. It's overlapping. It's very difficult to make generalizations. Um, but I would say that the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, the, the, the two top sort of, you know, groups in the Brotherhood are, you know, that, that, that group that came of age in the 1970s and 1980s, people like Issam al Aryan and so forth, who uh, want the Brotherhood to engage in politics and adopt a more sort of liberal uh, face, and, and the old guard of conservatives, you know, people who came of age in the Nasser regime, and, um, you know, agree that the Muslim Brotherhood should, should take advantage of the political moment, but, you know, um, are, are, are more sort of, you know, um, apt to sort of push for conservative interpretations of Sharia law. I think the Salafis um, are at the, the far margin of this. Mm -hmm. And I, I really don't think they're going to have an appreciable effect on the discourse of the Muslim Brotherhood as, as it develops, or Muslim Brotherhood policy. Um, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> nothing is for sure in this situation. Um, but I, I don't think the Salafis are going to pull the Brotherhood in the conservative direction, mm -hmm. simply because the weight of gravity is elsewhere. Right. Good. Okay. Let's take a couple more questions, one at the back and then one here. Go ahead. Um, beyond the, the dire economic situation in Egypt, in Egypt is the growing security situation inside. Right, I mean, this is a real sort of challenge for the Morsi uh, government um, to rein in these vociferous elements um, in, in Sinai. Um, and, and of course, I think um, Egypt will have to cooperate with Israel um, on this point. And because of the sort of frosty relations between Egypt and Israel, um, a, a full agreement is, is, is problematic. But in the end, it is in the interest of both Egypt and Israel to you know, secure the border and to make sure that Sinai does not remain a base for um, terroristic groups. Um, I think the Egyptian population is fully behind, you know, Morsi's efforts to 
rein in these elements. After all, a number of Egyptian police were killed. That didn't go down well with any sector amongst the Egyptian population. Um, so I think for practical reasons, um, you know, Egypt will, will cooperate with Israel. Last question. Um, I was curious, what do you think the Egyptian government will do as far as foreign policy? I mean, you mentioned the Morsi Street to Tehran. Um, but do you, do you see them maybe growing in a bigger role in Arab and Middle Eastern affairs? Or um, do you see them kind of internally, internally trying to focus on nation building at home? Or, you know, can they expand maybe counteract influence from the Gulf countries? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood really wants to sort of make Egypt once again an important player in regional politics. Um, you know, for a couple of decades, the, the role of Egypt in the Middle East had sort of diminished under Mubarak. Um, Saudi Arabia, perhaps, you know, took Egypt's place as one of the, the main sort of, you know, Arab players in, in, in the region. Um, but Egypt, of course, remains the most populous, you know, Arab country. Um, it, it continues to, to kind of wield the sort of cultural weight. And I think the Muslim brothers expect Egypt under their direction to sort of uh, have a renaissance, you know, uh, a political renaissance as well as a cultural one, that Egypt once again will, you know, lead the region uh, to independence and, 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 and uh, um, you know, in terms of an independent foreign policy. So, um, uh, one, you know, they, they want to sort of recapture Egypt's dignity. Okay, great. Well, um, David, just one, one sure. last question. Just returning again to this issue of who, uh, what is kind of the essential core of the Muslim Brotherhood? And you were just talking about the kind of spectrum from liberal to conservative where they overlap with the Salafists. And at the beginning of your talk, you talked about this basic principle that sovereignty resides in God. And follow that, essentially saying that, that God authored Sharia law. And it, it seems to me, as you move in that direction, as you were describing earlier, you're describing an ideology that is fundamentally hostile to women's rights, so that it's almost by definition puts women at risk of severe repression, and that it is more generally hostile to all universal individual rights. Now, Putting aside the question of whether the West has actual leverage, soft power, or hard power, would it, and I just want to get your view on this, for the US at this point the, and, the, and the Europeans and the entire secular world to be forcefully clear and consistent that the US rejects, or that Europe rejects, Japan rejects, again, the entire secular world rejects this approach to politics that it stands behind the continuation of the total freedom of operation of secular political parties, and also stands in complete hostility to Salafis who will ruthlessly deny those rights, and that that should be a clear, consistent, and open, and endlessly repeated message behind which stands issues of investment, issues of military assistance, and there's things like tourism on which the economy of Egypt is up. So that whether it's soft or hard, that some sort of forceful and consistent expression of a negative perspective on the worst tendencies of that movement might be part of global policy. Which, which well, hard leverage might lead to entrenchment, you know, might lead to the development of extremist movements, you know, emerging from the Brotherhood or from the margins of Egyptian society. Um, you know, I, I think the, the correct strategy is to engage with the Muslim Brotherhood, encourage them in the direction of liberalism. Yes, sovereignty resides with God, but the question is, you know, who interprets this divine will? And that divine will can be interpreted in a liberal way or in a conservative way. And, you know, these issues as we speak are being sort of deliberated, you know, in this constitutional um, committee. Um, it's an open question right now. Um, and I think we're all hoping that the Sharia will be interpreted in a more liberal way that will, you know, address women's rights and, and the rights of religious minorities and, and so forth. But I think playing hardball with the Muslim Brotherhood, um, with Egypt as a whole, uh, might backfire, um, lead to uh, a more sort of, you know, vociferous, angry, defiant attitude. And uh, that would sort of um, give scope to the more extreme 
conservative elements in, in Egyptian society. Okay, John, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Micheline, thank you for your contribution to this event. Um, we do have two more events, Center of Middle Eastern Studies, that um, we, were ha we, we, we will be having this quarter. Unfortunately, we don't have a website where you can find out about our future events, but we do have a Facebook page that um, has been set up so you can find out more about future events from our Facebook page. Thanks for coming. Thanks.